And thank you everybody who's online and just kind of hanging out with us. We'll be starting promptly at six, but we just wanna give everybody a little bit of time to get signed on for our 6 p.m. start. And for those of you um, who have not signed on already, uh, or not signed on, but filled out our sign-in sheet in advance, we'll be dropping a link in the chat for you. And if you could just take a moment to fill that out. There, and for those of you that are on, um, in case you become disconnected at any point during the meeting, this is also being live streamed to the Summit County Facebook page. Looks like we have a few more new attendees. So welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if there isn't a link in the chat already, we'll be dropping in one um, for new folks to sign in and we will be getting started at six, but we just wanted to give folks a chance to get signed in and settled before we begin. And this is also being live streamed to the Summit County Facebook page in the event that you, excuse me, get disconnected. Welcome new attendees. Um, for those of you, thanks for bearing along with our, our welcome speech, but we'll be getting started shortly right at six. But if you haven't already, we'd love if you take a moment to fill out our, our sign in form for the evening and we'll be putting a link in the chat for that. Looks like we have a couple more folks joining this evening. Thank you. We appreciate y'all being here. Um, we'll be getting started right now, actually. Thank you for, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Bree Binaboos. I am with the Communications and Public Involvement portion of the Kimball Junction Environmental Impact Statement Project Team. I'll be helping to moderate the meeting this evening, and I'm really glad that you all could join us. So thank you. I'd like to take a minute to introduce some key members of the study team who are serving as panelists, and they'll be sharing some information with you this evening. Um, and just 
everybody, I think all, all of our names match. Um, but Grant Farnsworth is the UDOT EIS project manager for, for this study. Carissa Watanabe is UDOT's environmental manager for this project. And Kyler, are you on? Um, anywho, and we've got Brian Adams as the consultant project manager. He's assisting Grant with managing the EIS. And Heidi Spore is our environmental manager or a consultant manager. And Charles Allen is our traffic analyst lead for the study. And then last but not least, um, Marissa Cooper and Kim Clark on the public involvement team. And Marissa will be providing links in the chat to you during the presentation um, for where all the information is located on our website. And before we get into kind of the the full our full presentation, I just wanted to go over a few um, participation guidelines, just as a reminder for what to expect this evening. If you haven't taken a haven't had a chance to look at our participation guide, so as we've mentioned, this is being recorded and also streamed to the Summit County Facebook page. So if you somehow become disconnected from Zoom, you would easily be able to to take a look at that on Facebook, and we'll also be posting a recording of the meeting um, on the project website. And I do want to remind folks, um, you know, that any questions or comments that you leave during the Q&A session this evening do need to follow um, UDOT social media pol uh, policy um, code of conduct, and we'll be posting a link in the chat because we really want everybody to be able to leave just specific great questions and to speak openly with the team, but we do ask that you please just um, respect other participants and attendees. So please refrain from um, any profanity or other um, questionable language um, or images, please, in the Q&A section or session. And after the presentation's over, we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible during the remaining time of the meeting. And you'll be able to ask questions using the question and answer function. So um, it should be the little Q&A icon with the, the talking clouds if you haven't used Zoom in a while. And we're going to answer them in the order that they're received. Um, but we just uh, want to keep in mind that you know, just with timing. And if we do get a high volume of questions, we might not be able to answer them all, but the study team will be reviewing everything or, you know, all the questions that, that we see um, both during the meeting and in a later time. And we'd also like to remind folks that if you were able to attend our open house last night, um, similar to that, just some of the, the questions and comments um, just back and forth with our study team members are really helpful to us throughout the study, but they're not um, considered formal comments for the EIS. So we do ask that you please leave any formal comments that you have via email on our website, um, we take voicemail and text um, or also mailed letter and we'll be dropping information to our contact section on our website as well. And our comment period is open through January 27th. Um, and one last reminder, if, if you haven't used this, filled out the sign in sheet, we would definitely appreciate that. Um, and this is really just to help monitor attendance at our public meetings. So please feel free to provide any inform as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. And if you would like to receive project updates, we will need an email address um, as well. And finally, as you're following along in the presentation, um, if any of the graphics seem hard to read, just depending on your computer screen size um, or phone, if you're, you're watching on phone, um, we will be dropping links to all of these materials in the chat, and you'll be able to view those on our website um, at any time if you'd like to zoom in on those. So thank you so much for letting me walk through the logistical details, and now I'm going to turn the time over to Grant. Thanks, Bree. Appreciate being able to do this virtual uh, meeting where we had the public meeting, and we appreciate all those that attended, but realize this is much more um, feasible for several of you. And with the winter weather, um, we understand why this is so much more convenient and possible for others to attend. So with that, let's uh, jump into the presentation, Bree. Thanks. So um, we cur currently, this graphic that you see in before you is a timeline of a project, the Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, 
is fortunate to have a robust planning study that completed just prior to the EIS. Through the first part of the presentation, I'll discuss the planning study or Kimball Junction and SR224 area plan and how it connects into the environmental phase. In 2021, UDOT, in partnership with Summit County, published the Kimball Junction and SR224 area plan that documented the results of a study conducted using UDOT solution development process. Um, that planning approach seeks to capture the unique context of an area or a corridor and then develop a set of solutions for its transportation needs. We are currently in the environmental phase and are using the results of the Kimball Junction and SR224 area plan to prepare an environmental impact statement or EIS and evaluate improvements at the I-80 and SR224 interchange at Kimball Junction and also on SR224 um, down to the Olympic Parkway intersection. So um, in the next slide, thanks. This kind of shows the study area for the Kimball Junction EIS. The area plan was conducted to identify and analyze capacity and multimodal improvements to address mobility, access, safety, and travel time reliability in the Kimball Junction area. And it addressed existing and long-term mobility needs for residents, commuters, and visitors to the study area shown. The transportation problems, as well as opportunities to solve these problems were established in the study area through input from study partners and the public. The area plan process analyzed several solutions and narrowed the options down to three alternatives that are being evaluated in the EIS. Thanks. The alternatives evaluation process included developing screening criteria based on the study goals listed in this slide to address the transportation problems. The process also included developing a full range of alternatives and documenting the elimination of alternatives to limit the need for reconsidering the full range of alternatives during the EIS process. The problems and opportunities developed during the area plan process have informed the purpose and need of this current study. I'll be discussing the alternatives in upcoming slides, and it's important to keep in mind that we are early in the process and these options are likely to change as we evaluate potential impacts and refine the concepts. And we'll be providing cost estimates for each alternative as the study progresses. So now we'll start looking at the alternatives. Um, first, the proposed alternatives include no, taking no action, then alternative A, which is slow, shown on this screen, which is a split diamond interchange and intersection improvements. Alternative B, which includes grade separated intersections with one way frontage roads to the I-80 interchange. Alternative C, which includes intersection improvements with pedestrian enhancements and any other reasonable alternative if identified during the uh, EIS process. If an alternative uh, does not meet that project purpose and need, or it's not reasonable, then it won't be carried forward for detailed consideration in, in the EIS. And before I start talking about the alternatives, I wanna um, make it clear that high resolution graphics can be found on the Kimball Junction website, and that we'll be adding some links to those graphics in the chat. These alternatives also include um, other projects that are on the long range plan um, outside of this, this project, such as the SR224 bus rapid transit, and also a highway safety project at the Ute Boulevard and SR224 intersection that includes adding northbound and southbound dual left turns. So alternative A was formerly known as alternative one in the area plan. This, area cons uh, this alternative consists of a split diamond interchange configuration. This the existing interchange at Kimball Junction would be converted into a diamond configuration, which basically is traffic signals at each of the off ramps and the interchange would be split between the existing location at SR224 and a bridge, new bridge crossing uh, west of SR224, just east of the uh, outlets and would connect into Landmark Drive. One way roads for both eastbound and westbound directions would connect the two intersections and tie into the on and off ramps for I-80. A pedestrian tunnel at Ute Boulevard uh, would be added for to allow users to move com comfortably across SR224. And intersection improvements include a northbound and southbound through lane on SR224 from Olympic Parkway to I-80. Some of the benefits include 
um, new access points or direct access to the west side of Kimball Junction, a pedestrian tunnel would increase connectivity and comfort for pedestrians. And this would reduce the travel time, increase mobility while minimizing queuing onto I-80. So now we'll be going to alternative B. Uh, this was formerly known as alternative three in the area plan. This option consists of grades separating intersections at Ute Boulevard and Olympic Parkway, and it would separate local and through traffic in the area. SR-224 would remain close to um, its current alignment, but it would be depressed below the crossing surface streets through the Kimball Junction. Um, the entrance ramps, um, you'd have entrance ramps at each of the uh, intersections. So. If you wanted to get to I-80 eastbound or Rasmussen Road and were heading northbound on SR-224, you would need to exit onto the frontage roads. Or more simply, if you didn't get off going northbound um, and just stayed on SR-224 mainline, your only option would be to turn onto westbound I-80. Um, a trench cover would go over the depressed SR-224 section between Olympic Parkway and Ute Boulevard to reduce the impacts of snowfall. The Ute, Bo uh, Ute Boulevard and Olympic Parkway intersections would tie into the frontage road system crossing over SR-224 on bridges. And we would need to um, cross or move the existing crossing south of uh, Olympic Parkway. Some of the benefits of this alternative include that the depressed section of SR-224 would have fewer visual impacts. It would minimize queuing on I-80 and improve travel time and mobility. And it would increase walking comfort by decreasing the volume uh, that crosses over travels nearby the pedestrian and bicycle routes. Uh, alternative C, uh, this was formerly known as alternative four. And again, these are all of the alternatives that have progressed through the area plan, the previous planning study. This consists of expanding uh, general purpose vehicle lanes and at strategic uh, locations, only uh, adding lanes for high occupancy vehicles or HOVs or carpool vehicles, um, while also improves pedestrian and bicycle accessibility. So as you can see, there's a this also has a pedestrian tunnel near Ute Boulevard. Um, it also has a northbound and southbound, adds a northbound and southbound lane on SR-224 north of Olympic Parkway, and it adds an additional lane on I-80 eastbound off-ramp uh, down to Ute Boulevard for uh, carpool or transit vehicles and other intersection improvements. This has the benefits, similar benefits as the others of uh, minimizing queuing on I-80 while reducing travel time and improving mobility. Um, it also um, increases pedestrian comfort um, by having that tunnel. So this is, we are currently just in the beginning stages. If you can go to the next slide, thanks, of the environmental study process. And through the study, there will be formal opportunities for the public to provide input on the alternatives that are being considered. The most helpful times to make your comments are during the formal comment periods. And it's also important to note that funding for any of the options has not been identified. If funding were to be identified for the alternative that UDOT selects in this process, construction could only begin after the final EIS and record of decision has been issue, issued, which we anticipate being in the fall of 2024. Thanks. So the purpose and need of a project um, defines the goals and objectives that the study will address, or call that the purpose, and identifies the existing and future conditions that need to be changed, or the need. Uh, the purpose and need divides uh, the, drives the environmental study process and lays the foundation for the types of al alternatives developed and how they are, are evaluated. These are the key needs for the area that need to be addressed. We will be going into more details about the current and future transportation challenges that the area will be facing and how that helps us determine the purpose of the project. As you can see, the project needs are failing conditions along SR-224, queues backing onto mainline I-80 and growing east-west active transportation demand. So now I'll, I'll let Charles go into greater detail about the transportation needs in the area. Thank you, Grant. One of the first questions of any study is, where is all this traffic coming from? 
at Kimball Junction, it's a mixture of through traffic and Kimball Junction access traffic. For example, during the AM and PM peak hours, which are 8 to 9 AM and 4 to 5 PM, 60% of the traffic going northbound on SR-224 continues through to I-80, while 40% turns off SR-224 at Ute Boulevard and Olympic Parkway to access businesses and homes. This means that through traffic and business and residential access traffic are both an important concern in finding transportation solutions for the area. Uh, looking at southbound traffic, the split is a little bit different. In the AM peak hour, again, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., it shows a higher proportion of through traffic, about 70%. This is because the retail and grocery land uses in Kimball Junction typically don't experience much morning traffic demand. Meanwhile, when we look at the p.m. peak hour, 4 to 5 p.m., the through traffic and the local access traffic is more evenly, evenly distributed with a 45% to 55% split. Uh, traffic performance can be measured many ways. For intersections, we often report an intersection level service. Intersection level service is an A to F letter grade of the overall intersection performance. Level service A means very little delay and level service F means extreme congestion. The UDOT goal is to achieve level service D or better. Existing in 2050 conditions were measured using a traffic simulation model. The model simulates winter weekday conditions Results show several intersections operating at level service E or F. For example, with existing conditions, the I-80 interchange is level service F in the AM peak, and the Olympic Parkway intersection is level service F in the PM peak. These two intersections are the first traffic signals drivers experience as they come into Kimball Junction in the morning and leave in the evening. For 2050, no action conditions, which means year 2050 traffic levels without any major roadway improvements to the Kimball Junction area. Intersection level service gets worse. This is because traffic volumes on SR224 are predicted to grow by about 30 to 40% by then. Another way to measure traffic performance is to look at queue lengths or how far vehicles stack up waiting to get through a traffic signal. During the morning, the biggest queues are drivers waiting to exit I-80 onto SR224 that back up the eastbound off ramp. Today, the queues can reach a half mile long and start to back onto I-80 mainline. And during the 2021-22 winter season, the queues backed up onto I-80 about 49 times. By 2050, the queues are predicted to be over three miles long and back up past the Jeremy Ranch interchange. During the PM, the longest queues are northbound vehicles starting from the Olympic Parkway signal and backing up to the south. The queues exceed two miles, or excuse me, the queues exceeded two miles 25 times during the 2021-2022 winter season. And by 2050, these queues will regularly extend as far back as Canyons Resort Drive. Uh, vehicle travel times are another important way to measure performance. Uh, southbound travel times are measured from the start of the eastbound I-80 off-ramp to onto SR-224 and then just past the Olympic Parkway intersection. There's a lot of variability in travel times from day to day, depending on skier traffic and other factors. During uncongested periods, this travel time is about two minutes. On the worst days, it can grow to 15 minutes. A uh, typical winter weekday, which we call the 85th percentile day, the travel time is five and a half minutes. The 85th percentile uh, day travel time is ex predicted to grow to 11 minutes by 2050. Northbound travel times are measured from just north of Canyons Resort Drive on SR224 to I-80. Again, there's great variability from day to day. Uncongested days experience a travel time of about five minutes. That can grow to 20 minutes on the worst days and the 85th percentile day travel time is 12 minutes for existing conditions, and that will nearly double to 23 and a half minutes in 2050. Interestingly, the majority of worst conditions occur on weekdays, meaning Monday to Friday, rather than on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. The mixture of skier, commuter, and school traffic on weekdays results in overall worst conditions at Kimball Junction than on weekends. Finally, transit and active transportation, and when we say active transportation, we mean walking, biking, and scootering, uh, 
are important considerations and of the Kimball Junction mobility. Transit ridership at the Kimball Junction Transit Center is expected to grow from about 270 boardings per day to 1,700 boardings per day in the year 2050. In the summer, there are about 800 daily active transportation trips crossing SR-224 at various locations. The majority of these use the tunnel south of Olympic Parkway. And of note, the tunnel has doubled in its usage since a count that was conducted back in the year 2016. All right, well, thank you for all of that data, Charles. So Grand Charles has covered why the project is needed and therefore the purpose of the project is to address transportation related safety and mobility for all users of the Kimball Junction area by improving operations and travel times from IAD through Olympic Parkway, improving safety on mainline IAD by reducing the off-ramp queues or the lines of vehicles backing up, improving pedestrian and bicyclist mobility and accessibility in the area. So mobility is, you know, what are my options? How far can you go in a given amount of time? And accessibility is how much you can get to in that amount of time and the quality of that travel experience. Um, and also maintaining or improving transit travel time. As some of you may already know, Summit County and FTA are currently wrapping up an environmental study uh, to implement bus rapid transit on SR-224 from Olympic Parkway and Kimball Junction down to Empire Avenue in Park City. So we wanna ensure that any improvements we propose to make will be compatible with the BRT and allow it to perform and function as it was designed to. So the project's purpose and need are important when it comes to how we narrow down or screen our alternatives. As Grant had mentioned, the alternatives presented today are those that have made it through the screening process in the area plan study, which had evaluated 30 alternatives. So the study conducted fatal flaw analysis and evaluated preliminary traffic performance and environmental impacts consistent with the goals and objectives of the area plan to eliminate any unreasonable alternatives. So any new alternatives that are proposed for this EIS would go through the same initial screening that was in the area plan to evaluate if it's a reasonable alternative to be carried forward. So using the project's purpose and need, we'll look at more detailed traffic analysis for each alternative with the metrics that Charles had covered. So like the travel times, intersection performance, and queue lengths of cars, um, backing up onto IED, creating those unsafe conditions. For active transportation, we'll be evaluating pedestrian and bicycle connectivity and comfort. So is it you know, direct and convenient to the destinations you want to, where you want to go? Is it a comfortable experience? No one you know, wants to feel like they're playing Frogger when they're trying to cross the road. And we'll also be screening on environmental impacts of each alternative for resources such as wetlands and threatened and endangered species. So please feel free to comment on any new screening criteria or measures that you think that we should be using to evaluate alternatives in this study. And I will pass it over to Bree, who will be able to provide you with more details on how you can comment and stay involved in this study. Bree, yeah, you're on mute. Just on mute. Sorry guys, forgot about that, you know two years worth of Zoom meetings all out the window. Um, but, you know, as Carissa mentioned, public involvement is an important part of the environmental study process. So I just like to go over how you um, how the community can provide input to UDOT, what to focus your comments on, and how comments are used in the environmental study process. So with that, um, as you all know, we're holding two public meetings for this phase of the study, which included last night's open house. And for those of you that might have joined us then, thanks for, for braving the snowstorm. And then tonight's meeting. And digital copies of the information that was on display at the open house. So, you know, there are some very large maps of the proposed alternatives that show a little bit more detail, along with the display boards um, on traffic information that Charles went through, and some of the information Carissa went through regarding uh, the project's um, purpose and the screening are also available on the study website. And I believe Marissa has been dropping the links to those display boards in the chat 
as well if you'd like to take a look at any of those. Um, printed copies of the fact sheets that were linked in this chat are also available um, in English and in Spanish at the Park City and Summit County Libraries. So if you're aware of any community members who would like information in the study but would just prefer to view printed copies, um, we've got those available at, that, at those locations. And then as we, we mentioned earlier, a recording of tonight's meeting will be posted on our study website. And then it will also be on the Summit County Facebook page for community members who are unable to attend. And just a big thank you to, uh, to Summit County for offering to live stream this for us to reach out to our county residents. So we appreciate that. Oh, sorry, skipped over a whole thing there, our, our public comment period. So this did begin on December 27th, and we have been receiving comments throughout this time. So we do appreciate everybody who took a little time to start reviewing some of the information on the website and share their ideas with us. It definitely gives us a better understanding and of the needs of the community and some of the impacts we should be looking at and, and really just to kind of help prepare for these meetings to make sure we're address or answering as much as we can for you all. And really the areas that we'd like folks to focus their comments on um, include the proposed alternatives that you saw this evening, uh, the purpose and need of the, the project. Um, as, as Grant mentioned, that's a really big driver for the types of alternatives that are being evaluated. Um, criteria that UDOT should, use, should consider when uh, evaluating those proposed alternatives. So the screening criteria that Carissa mentioned earlier and then potential impacts to the natural and built environments, you know, our homes, animals, air, those types of resources, and really any other significant issues in the study area that the team should be aware of. Um, and, you know, any new transportation related alternatives that UDOT should consider developing for further evaluation. Um, as Grant mentioned earlier, you know, there's there's a few different options out there, whether it's no action, the three that you saw tonight or, or anything new. And so really the comments that the community provides in this phase of the study um, helps inform the future phases. So we really do hope that folks will get involved early on, um, whether it's proposing new alternatives or identifying key issues. Um, this really helps us as we progress further along with um, determining criteria to evaluate them. And with that, I would I'd just like to take a quick segue um, for anybody online that hasn't been uh, to our project website. We would just like to quickly walk you guys through where to find some of this information. Um, I know it's, especially if you didn't want to jump into the chat, I know that can be a little bit hard sometimes. Um, a lot of stuff to manage. I know I, I do with that. Um, so this is, would be our project website that you're seeing on screen, and uh, this will be where you can find the most up-to-date information on the project. And we can access some of the open house materials in two different ways. Um, right here, if you just click on this navigation bar or that big orange bar down there, this will take you to everything that you saw this evening, um, including a PDF copy of the presentation the fact sheets, both in English and in Spanish, and then our display boards and the large scale maps that we were discussing, along with some of the other technical documents that might be of interest to you, such as uh, the traffic information that Charles was going through and the actual purpose and need report that, um, that we had summarized just a little bit earlier. So with that, let's see if I can switch over quickly. And these are just all the ways to contact us, which are also listed on the contact us section of the website. Steps in the process is alternatives development. So this will be, you know, alternatives will be a little bit further refined and we'll start looking at some of the potential impacts associated with each of these alternatives develop any new alternatives based on the input that we receive from the community during the current comment period, and even some of the other details um, such as cost estimates. So that's coming a little bit further down the pipeline, you know, throughout the spring and summer of this year. So with that, um, before we start the Q&A session, 
Um, I just wanted to remind folks who might have joined late that we'll be taking questions in the Q&A and we've seen some of those come through. Um, and we also saw a couple come through the chat that we'll be getting into and we will try to answer as many of those as possible this evening. Um, but if we aren't able to answer your question this evening at all, please make sure to submit that as a comment so that way the team will still have an opportunity to better understand your issue and be able to take that into consideration. And I guess I shouldn't just say issue, but just any of your ideas, thoughts, and input. So with that, um, just thank you everybody for being here and we'll get into questions and answers now. So I think our first question um, came from Bruce Carmichael, um, which was any consideration to adding a new I-80 exit to feed into the Ecker Hill Park and Ride. So Grant, do you want to take that one? Thanks, Bree. Um, and thanks, Bruce, for that question. Um, and when we were looking at in the planning study, uh, one of the alternatives that are potential solutions that we were looking um, at did include an interchange at Ecker View Park and Ride. Um, that one was um, didn't it was actually considered mostly for HOV and transit and um, but it did not provide enough incentive to come off or, or provide enough of a benefit from the traffic um, it also was there were also concerns about the connection through um, the open space so that uh, connection was eliminated we've also been asked about just having a, a specific slip ramp off um, of the I-80 so that it would just be one direction from I-80 eastbound only. And we work with FHWA, the Federal Highways Administration, um, whenever we have access changes to the interstate. And um, they do, do not allow those type of slip ramp accesses unless there's a strong and justifiable reason. And when we discussed with this, uh, this with them, um, just two years ago, this was not considered um, uh, such a reason in their regard. So we've heard this question a few times and uh, we've brought it up, but it, it does not look like it's, that has been looked at, but it's not something we're considering in this EIS any further. Excellent. Thank you for that, Grant. Our next question um, is from user JJMLF which is how is a diamond interchange different than what we have now? Yeah, um, one of the things that we have now currently at the interchange is, is called a single point urban interchange. And so as the name implies, all of the uh, off ramps come to one traffic signal. And so a diamond is more of a, your typical traffic signal as you go to other off ramps such as US 40 and uh, 248. Um, sometimes they do have traffic signals, sometimes they're just stop controlled, um, but you have two different intersections on each side. And so um, that's the main difference from right now, you just have one traffic signal where the off ramps converge so that you can make left turns at the same time. Um, but in a typical diamond inter intersection, those are separated and at different intersections. Feel free right. to jump in, Charles. Yeah. No, you're you're exactly right, and, and I think you're you pointed out an example of diamond interchange at SR two forty eight and US forty, or where Kearns Boulevard from Park City connects to US forty. That's a good example of a diamond interchange. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. Our next question is from Bruce Carmichael. Is the work expected or planned to be completed prior to the 2030 Olympics? So I'm just going to reiterate that this project currently doesn't have any funding um, for it. So we do not have a projected completion timeline, but this study is we are on pace to be completed uh, by the fall of 2024. So um, we'll have an idea of how much this project will cost and it'll be considered for prioritization and other funding opportunities um, when we have an idea of what the, when we know what the preferred alternative will be. Great, thanks Grant. Our next question is from attendee uh, D with alternatives currently considered, 
do they allow for a long tractor semi trailer and pup, so two trailers, to exit I 80 eastbound at Kimball Junction, turn left, and enter Rasmussen Road to go back westbound on Rasmussen? This sounds like a specific experience that somebody has uh, <laughs> witnessed or, or had a need for. Um, so the alternatives, as, as shown, have different design vehicles that they uh, look at and, and uh, um, evaluate. Um, Jeff, it, we're, we're pretty early in the process and haven't gone through that. I'm not sure if you talked through uh, some of the design assumptions as but this is pretty early and we haven't gone through those type of designs. Yeah, the, the typical vehicle that UDOT uses for um, for turning radius on an interstate and everything is a WB60. I don't know off the top of my head what the turning radius is compared to um, the, the double pop, but we, we will meet whatever UDOT standard is. And um, that's something we could look at if that's something that's that's used a lot in that area though. Yeah, that's the type of comment that would be good to capture. And, and if there are a reason for uh, going outside of our standard that we can justify and observe, um, that's really helpful yeah. to be aware of. Yes, yeah, so thank you, um, attendee D. That, that would be great. Um, I know Marissa's got a link in the chat uh, to our, our website comment link as well. So thank you for that. Um, our next question is coming from Kathleen Mears. Uh, what do you project different in 2050 from now? Uh, more development? Uh, Charles, do you want to go over kind of what's in our 2050 uh, traffic projections? Yeah, you bet. Um, I was going to make a joke about cryptocurrency takes over by 2050, but I think we're, we're talking about other <laughs> types of, of uh, projections for for 2050, uh, countywide, the, the entire county's population is expected to grow by 33%. So, you know, more development in a lot of different places. Um, in migration, population increases because of births. Uh, likewise, we expect uh, the number of jobs in the county to grow by about 53%. And these numbers come from uh, state forecasting um, experts from the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute. So overall development, both within the Kimball Junction area as well as outside of it, will contribute to more traffic in the area. Excellent. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, next question. I'm, oh, I'm, sorry, Grant, go ahead. I'm just going to say like uh, the, the memo that you talked about in the website that kind of goes into deeper depth of what all those developments um, and assumptions are in our traffic forecasts. They want to go into further detail and look at that. Great. Thank you. And we'll grab a link for that and drop it in for you all as well. Our next question comes from Katie Owens Hubler with option B How will a vehicle coming from I 80 eastbound, then south on 224, make a left hand turn onto Ute Boulevard and into Kimball Junction? Yeah, I'm not sure if you want to bring up. Um, can you can you go to the the yep. website and bring up the en enhanced image? Yeah. Oh, do you want me to go back to the presentation or uh, one of the one of the boards? One of the boards would be a little bit, I think, more detail. Yeah. All righty. Yep. We will pull that up right now. And I can start talking about it, but it's always easier if yeah. you can see it. Yep. Absolutely. There we go. And or actually, Grant, would one of the uh, scroll plots be helpful? Yeah, that's what I was meaning. Okay. So alternative B is what she was. Yeah. And for those of you that were unable to join us last night, these were some of the large scale display boards that were at the open house. Thanks. And if you can zoom in on the, yeah, that part, perfect. A little bit further, maybe 50% or even, yeah. So here you can see like you're talking about coming eastbound from eastbound. So it sounds like you'd be making a westbound left turn. 
and then there'll be the option of getting off onto the frontage road system. And so you would take a get off on the frontage road system um, and then make a left turn and get in, and go on to U Boulevard that way. So the frontage road system is really the key to accessing the local system. And these two intersections are so closely spaced that they don't have off ramps for both of the intersections on and off ramps. That's why we need a, a frontage road system. Thanks for bringing that up, Bree. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Grant. Our next question comes from JT. It is hard to understand if any of the options include a direct throughway from I-80 eastbound off-ramp through to 224 southbound, no traffic light, and similarly from 224 northbound through to I-80 throughway or I-80 westbound without removing the traffic light at the I-80 and 224 interchange and providing a direct throughway from on and off to the highway, I don't understand how UDOT feels that travel times will be reduced as the interstate interchange pinch point would still exist, backing up traffic on 224 and the I-80 exit. Would you clarify if any of the options remove the traffic light at the I-80 interchange? Thanks. Uh, Charles, could you talk about some of what uh, the choke points that we um, discovered was we were doing the transportation anal analysis and, and some of the previous uh, solutions that we looked at during the area plan that had flyovers. Yeah, absolutely. Now, first of all, one of the things we learned early on was that the interchange is not the major choke point in the corridor. The major choke point is the signals at Ute and Olympic. And backups there interfere with how the interchange operates. So if we can improve the performance of the signals and the interchange will do a lot better. Um, during the, the area study process, there were lots of ideas thrown out of maybe how to make direct connections between I-80 and SR 224, like you're talking about. Um, some of them required major tunnels or major bridges that were you know, deemed really expensive or incompatible with the vision of what the, the community wants Kimball Junction to be and to look like. Um, but what we have found is with these three alternatives we presented today, we're able to achieve good traffic operations through the whole area. So um, none of them take away the signal that is at the interstate, but through other improvements, we're able to get good performance on the roadways. Thanks, Great. Charles. I, I just add also, we, we looked at a tunnel uh, connecting all the way to I-80 as well but um since sr2 or i80 goes underneath the crossing at 224 it really got costly really fast as well so we tried to look at some um, bigger concepts in the area plan thanks grant the next question comes from renee dupree uh, cost will be an important consideration it wasn't clear from the timelines. When is that estimated and assessed? Can you say when that comes into play? Yeah, sure. So um, in the NEPA process, costs may be considered during the initial screening process if the cost of an alternative is extraordinary. So that's generally what we define as like magnitudes higher than other alternatives. So as Graham was just talking about, you know, tunneling under I-80, uh, that could put it over, you know, magnitudes of cost higher than other alternatives. And when it's that much higher, it would therefore exceed any reasonable expectation of funding. Um, but the alternatives identified to date are all within the same order of magnitude and will therefore be screened on how well they meet the purpose and need of the project and their potential impacts. So if numerous alternatives uh, perform similarly and have uh, comparable environmental impacts, costs may then be used as a screening criteria. Great. Well, thanks, Carissa. Our next question comes from Tracy W., and this is very similar. Um, how much of the funding would be federal? At this time, we don't have any funding uh, identified, and so it could be funding could come from a um, a combination of locations or one location 
um, all by itself. So that could be state, could be federal. Uh, those are the primary areas or could be a combination of local among those other two or all three or even private of some sort. But no uh, funding has been identified, but um, that'll be worked out in the next phases. Great, thanks Grant. Our next question comes from PF. Will the wall along Bittner Road at Kimball Junction be reconstructed or changed? How will this impact the homes along this area? I think, I'm not sure if you're um, specifically referring to noise, um, but on for this project, it's a type one noise project. And so we will be evaluating the noise impacts of the alternatives. Um, to see if noise mitigation measures, you know, such as a noise wall is appropriate. But when there are existing, you know, noise walls in place, um, even if the project doesn't, you know, per our policy as of today, even if a project doesn't warrant a noise wall, um, if we remove one, we will replace one. This, this might be referring to the retaining wall also. Wow. And, um, and if that's the case, um, we're just too early to, to look at design issues. I, it might be the noise wall, but um, we, we don't know those levels, but that'll be part of, since we're so early, that'll be uh, addressed as we go further and look at some of the impacts and um, a little bit further design of some of these alternatives. Great, thanks Grant. Our next comment comes from Alyssa Schofield. Could you explain a bit more of what a depressed road with a trench cover looks like? What is a trench cover? Also, would a depressed roadway impact the water flow into the nearby Swanner wetlands? Um, sorry, just making sure I'm off mute. Okay. Um, Jeff, could you go over kind of what a, a trench cover is? We're still pretty early in this also, um, and a lot of those details would be looked at, but Jeff, if you could go over that as well. Yeah, so so basically a trench cover would be similar to a bridge. Um, there would be girders across the roadway holding up either concrete or, you know, like a lot of places there's trench covers, like up in Seattle, for instance, there's a lot of um, tunnels and trench covers in areas and sometimes they have parks above it. Um, this we don't have that big of an area. So um, those kind of details will be figured out later, obviously, based on funding and you know where the money's coming from. But basically, it's just putting in a cover kind of like be like a bridge over the whole thing. Um, it just won't have to be as hefty as a, a normal bridge to carry cars, just be, you know, potes potentially pedestrians or, you know, stuff like that on it. Um, and I guess in Utah, um, it'd be similar to some of the ones downtown. Like a lot of times, if you see the streets downtown that go into the parking garages, that's kind of the way this would be set up. It, the, the road would go depressed down, there'd be walls on both sides and, um, Downtown, you know, you might have streets or buildings above it, but that'd be the same concept. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. That was certainly enlightening to me, too. Um, our next question is from JJMLF, uh, related to funding again. Is there funding in the works? What are the chances of getting funding? And, you know, why bother with the study if there is no funding on the horizon? I think uh, we've kind of talked about funding previously, but when we like to talk about funding, we emphasize the, the funding source that we have control over, which is the Transportation Investment Fund. I mean, the, the, the funding that we um, prioritize here at UDOT. And, and so we're currently programmed out to, to 2030, uh, but every few years we consider additional um, projects to be funded. And so this project would compete in the next prioritization process against other infrastructure projects in the, in the date. Sometimes we also receive additional money um, to be programmed and prioritized. And if that was the case, this could be part of that prioritization process. 
Um, we also, um, when we complete this study, we'll have an idea of what project would be needed. And so we'll have a number and uh, in case an opportunity for funding comes along. Um, so it's good to be ready of what that's what is needed. Um, but sometimes different circumstances bring forth those funding opportunities. Great. Thank you. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, our next question is from Brandy Connolly. Will this process consider how design will impact or improve active transportation and traffic flow further down 224 by the canyons or Bear Hollow area? Let's see, Charles, do you wanna tackle that one? Yeah, I'll answer in two parts. First of all, will the process consider uh, active transportation? The answer is yes. And then the kind of second part of the question is, will it consider active transportation traffic flow further down 224 by the canyons or Bear Hollow? And now this, this uh, study is focused on just the Kimball Junction area. So we're looking at improvements for this area and not trying to identify improvements down in other parts of SR 224. Great, thank you, Charles. Uh, the next question comes from Carl. Would there be any benefit to I-80 access out the backside of New Park so that all traffic from New Park businesses doesn't have to come back through the Kimball Junction interchange? So I think this one um, is kind of referring to alternative A where we have the split diamond interchange and we have the access on the west side and suggesting adding an access on the direct access on the east side. And in the area plan, we actually did have that east access included as part of this alternative. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, but that um, access had such little usage um, that it was just adding to the cost but not providing a benefit. And so we eliminated it um, as, as part of the refinement of that alternative. Yeah, you're exactly right, Grant. It didn't have enough benefit to justify staying in. Overall, there's a lot more traffic coming uh, to and from the west to Kimball Junction and not nearly as much coming to and from the east. So there's a lot more benefit to have that extra access on the west side and the east side just wasn't generating much, much benefit. Thank you, Charles. Our next question comes from Chris and Michelle Sammartino. We live at the exit ramp and have noticed a huge increase of traffic noise over the last 10 years. Are any of the alternatives better to curb or hold steady the traffic noise experienced in the area of Powderwood and Walmart at the off ramp? Yeah, so we haven't um, completed a noise analysis yet on the alternatives and that will happen further down the process. Um, but I will say like with the different alternatives, so our noise abatement policy, we look at like a certain threshold. So for a residential, it's like 66 decibels. So um, a taller noise wall may be warranted with one of the alternatives as opposed to, you know, let's say alternative A, we may have a different noise wall height as opposed to alternative C. Um, but the goal would be the same, uh, volume or what you hear of, you know, 66 decibels. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, thanks, Carissa. That's great. And we've also, um, I think Marissa can drop a link in the chat, but we have, UDOT's got a great explainer video as well, just kind of on the noise wall policy at well that we'd love for you, for you all to take a look at. Um, our next question comes from Craig Hahn and can the trench cover be vegetated? Um, Jeff and Grant. Yeah, do you want to go, with Jeff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As mentioned, yeah, as mentioned earlier, um, it it could be vegetated. So that's that's probably a detail that won't get we won't get into too deeply in the environmental stage. But once the project gets funded, they would probably look at that. But. Um, the cost would will likely go up the more weight you have on it. Just like I said, if it's if there's cars, obviously it would be a lot more 
have you know bigger girders to hold up the weight so that's just some of the details that that can get into but yeah it could be it could very well be vegetated and um have grass area or anything but you know you just have to account for that weight in design and one of the primary reasons why we initially had the trench cover is uh, just with it being depressed it'll likely be shaded most of the time and just the concern about getting it iced um, so try to reduce this snow cover or the snow impacts um, with, with with all of the snow that's received through this area um, being able to keep it moving and, and not dangerous for for vehicles but it'll be something that works with the we work with the local government um, as we look at potential options. But that is the primary reason that it was considered. Great, thank you, Grant and Jeff. Our next question comes from Thomas Cook. Related to option B, can you show us or point out an example case in Utah where a depressed road trench cover is utilized? Yeah, I don't know that there's any specific ones, but it'd be similar, like I, like I mentioned, to um, some of the streets downtown where you, you have um, the ramp that dives down between like the frontage or, you know, something, and you have walls on both sides. And then down there, it actually sometimes is street on top, but that'd be, it'd be similar to that case. Yeah, we had people that were uh, giving us examples of, of other countries, how it's uh, utilized and various ways and there's other states that um, obviously have different uh, widths and have like you were mentioning with with parks or soccer fields or or other things like that but it, it just kind of changes from location people can be pretty creative yeah. with it great thanks guys our next question is from attendee 059233. I heard Charles say that the choke points can be improved by changing the traffic light configuration. Can this be achieved now without changing infrastructure? Yeah, I apologize if, if I misspoke or came across that way. What I was I meant to say is that um, improvements like adding lanes and reconfigure the intersections not just the signal timing but changes to the intersections themselves and their number of lanes and their lane configurations can provide improvements that help the system so nothing can be done right now just changing signal timing alone to uh to get the kind of results that we want all right thanks for that clarification charles yeah. Uh, oh, I would just yeah, add that, yeah, this this area has been looked at pretty closely with the signal timing and trying to squeeze optimize as much as we can of of the existing capacity that we have because um, signal timing can make a really big difference if if it's done poorly um, but at some point you do get to the the breaking point of how much signal timing can do so it's always good to investigate and that method as far as it can take you. Yeah, and I'll add that this particular area actually has a really cool adaptive signal timing system where the, the, the signals talk to each other and coordinate on the fly as traffic demand changes over time. Great, good information. Thanks guys. Our next question comes from Ted Palamaki. I'm sorry if I, I mispronounced that. Um, what improvements or enhancements to the Kimball Junction Transit Center are associated with any of the options, so A through C? I think our biggest improvements to the Transit Center are, are the access to getting there across SR 224. And so that would include the pedestrian tunnel in alternatives A and C near Ute Boulevard, and, and also just uh, where they would have to cross less traffic, but at grade um, at Ute Boulevard and option B or alternative B. Um, Heidi Spore is actually the, the consultant project manager on the SR224. Um, I'm not sure if you wanna talk about how that'll be coming into the transit center or some of the boarding expectation increases as well. 
Sure, Grant. What, what I would add is that as part of the bus rapid transit project, um, the northbound bus will turn left at Olympic Parkway and access the transit station sort of from the, the back side. So the, the transit project is staying out of SR-224 between U Boulevard and Olympic Parkway um, sort of for two reasons. One, we know that this project is coming and we don't want to put in a, a lot of infrastructure that may then um, get torn out down the road. And two, um, travel times for that bus can actually be quicker on the backside rather than, than um, on a crowded part of SR-224 between U and Olympic. Um, and I should note that Charles um, did, did traffic and travel time studies for that BRT project and the dual left configuration um, northbound actually also improves um, auto, auto travel times as well. It really sort of helps the bus and, and cars get through that intersection a little bit more efficiently. Great, thank you, Heidi. That's super helpful. Our next question, oh, sorry, Grant, were you gonna? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Um, our next question is from Bonnie Park. Uh, please explain how every non-motorized transportation connection will be preserved with each alternative. With this, with the second alternative moves the, with the second alternative moving the current trail underpass south, but adds pedestrian sidewalks. Who is responsible for snow removal on those 224 crossings on the overpasses? Yeah, Bonnie, I think your concern is um, is really just to make sure that we maintain and, and improve the active transportation experience. Uh, this, and looking at this, it's a very high quality experience for active transportation users with the shared use paths on the east side and on the west side um, with the um, crossing that exists to the south. And we are really focused on maintaining and improving that. Um, I, rather than going through all alternatives um, and, and how those are being maintained and improved, we've, we've tried to show that those are, that's why we added those dotted lines, the green lines to show we, we definitely are um, aware of all of those and the importance of those active transportation trails and um, the importance of those to the community and building on that. And so that's why we are, are looking at um, adding uh, the pedestrian tunnels and alternatives A and, and C and, and moving, um, making sure that one is being replaced just because it's going low, depressed um, the roadway. Obviously, you can't have a tunnel through there. Um, and so it's maybe a good public comment would be, of, you know, the trade off of having it closer to where the current crossing is and residents are, but having it, the visual impact and back and forth often you have to make sure that um, disabled people can access it. So usually those require greater ramps versus moving it south. Um, that's something we were trying to look at, but with the, as far as the snow removal, that's something that we work with the local governments with on maintenance agreements. And, uh, but typically in general, above curb is, is the responsibility of the local governments. Great, thank you, Grant. Our next question comes from Brian Colby. What is the timing and scope of the 224 safety improvement, uh, safety project improvements mentioned earlier? So this might be another reference to 220, the 224 BRT and some of the other things in, in the wings. I think this is related to the dual left the turn. Dual. Okay. And uh, uh, I don't have that. I know I've looked it up a few times and let me, can we go on to the next question? Unless someone else from the team already has that. I know we've, I believe it's fiscal year 2025 is when the dual lefts at Youth Boulevard are programmed to go in. Thanks. So fiscal year for us starts in July. So I think that would be after July of 2024. 
Great. Well, with that, just looking, um, I believe that is all of the questions. We've gotten through all the questions so far. And for those of you um, that put your questions in, you know, if, if you want any further clarification, we could certainly go through that. It looks like we've got a little bit of time left this evening. Let's see what all the ones in the chat put on. Oh, uh, I think we had one just come in. It's got a, oh, excellent. A stamp of 705, hot off the press. Excellent. Yes, our hot off the press question comes from Craig Hahn. Of the three options presented, is one clearly better than the others for moving traffic at peak times? So all of these, uh, I guess I'll, I'll defer to you, Charles, real quick. Yeah, the, uh, the answer is no. When we were doing the area study prior to this, and we kind of came up with a whole bunch of ideas, dozens of ideas, and narrowed it down to these three, we were um, surprised but pleased to find that all three of these could achieve the you know, traffic movement goals that we'd, that we'd set. So all three of them seem like plausible options. Now we're going to refine them in this study process and look at them, look at them in a little bit more detail. And as we you know, sharpen our pencils, if you will, we might find some more distinguishing differences between these alternatives from a traffic operation standpoint. And I, I would just add that when we did our traffic analysis in the area plan, we um, typically what's done is, is you gather days on a typical, just a kind of a random winter day. And that's what we did. And then in this environmental study, we've gathered a lot more um, all of the days basically of winter and, and analyze them to get an idea of the variability. And so I uh, made a, some additional tweaks about um, which day we're representing in the model and or type of day um, due to the Federal Highways Administration guidance of um, looking at the variations in, in days and understanding that closer. And so like Charles said, there'll probably be a little bit more refinement on those um, traffic um of, of how much each one uh improves traffic great thank you grant our next question is from zero uh attendee zero five nine two three three what is the purpose or function of the depressed roadway uh, so we kind of talked about how it uh it helps with the visual and um, noise impacts by going underneath. It also reduces um, the, really the connectivity of, of the neighborhoods. Um, th those were some of the reasons. I'm not sure if uh, others want to pipe in. Yeah, from a traffic standpoint, the benefit is allowing SR224 traffic to go underneath Olympic Parkway and U Boulevard and not have to stop. Yeah, I guess the ones I was talking is that's why we're going under, not over. <laughs> um, but yes, that is definitely the biggest purpose is the traffic benefits. Great, thank you. We have another question from Katie Owens Hubler. Was there any statistical or Monte Carlo analysis performed on the traffic flow studies? To ask another way, what happens if, say, the 2050 traffic projections underpredict traffic by 50 percent? Charles, do you want to talk about our the, tra the traffic analysis as well? Yeah, Grant touched on this briefly. At the very beginning, we took an entire winter's worth of data to look at the statistical patterns of traffic from day to day. So we can compare, you know, the, the low traffic performance days with the high traffic performance days and identify the outliers and, and how, you know, how, uh, how different days can be from one another and, and try and pick a sweet spot in analyzing normal traffic conditions, but encompassing most days without getting skewed by the outlier days where something crazy may happen, like a ton of snow and a, and a wreck that shuts down a, a road for a while. 
Um, so we feel really good about uh, trying to find that sweet spot with these existing conditions. With our future conditions, uh, we are relying on the best data available, which is you know, statewide data sets about growth and then travel demand models, which pull land use and, and uh, you know, kind of travel times and road networks together and tries to predict where everybody drives and how much volume we'll have on the road. So this is the best we have. We, you know, I think what you're referring to is maybe some ways to, to stress test the, uh, you know, what if the what if the models off, but it, it can go either way. If the model's under by 50%, then we might accept that it might also be over by 50%. So picking our best possible estimate of the future, we feel like we're in a good spot to then compare alternatives to each other and see how well they do with the predicted travel demand. Great. Well, thank you, Charles. We have another question from Ted Palamaki. If there is major development near the current Skull Candy building, like hundreds of units of affordable housing, does that impact the assumptions made here? Do you want me to jump in, Grant? <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, uh, generally no, because in our 2050 growth assumptions, we are assuming uh, development within the Kimball Junction area as well as outside the Kimball Junction area. So, uh, you know, we're accommodating future growth near Skull Candy as well as, you know, areas that might bring trips from outside into the Kimball Junction area. So, yeah. Oops. Broke finger. Um, I just reiterate where we we do capture growth happening in that area. Um, all forecasts are obviously a little bit subject to change, and so, but we feel like we've got a good um, general awareness of the growth happening in different areas of Park City and in this area, and um, things that have been identified by the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, that work with all the stakeholders and local and elected officials to try to understand what's being planned and um, potentially could happen in this area and surrounding areas. Great, thanks guys. We have a question um, from Jean Whiting. How about Olympics traffic? Oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, the Olympics is a great uh, special event that occurs. And as Charles has indicated, uh, we look at existing and 2050 conditions. And um, even when we're looking at this year, we're not solving or not looking to, to mitigate the worst of the days. And um, so we really want to um, be aware of what the 2050 conditions are. And so at we, whenever some a special event does occur, a lot of times we'll put together, especially in the Olympics case, uh, put together special operations um, plans, um, and and that's really what is used to to make sure that things run smoothly and people get to where they need to go um, during the Olympics is the special events plan. So, from a traffic perspective, it doesn't come into play in the EIS process, um, although we are aware that that is um, hopefully going to come to Utah soon. Thanks, Grant. We have a question from Kathleen Mears. How much growth do you expect in Kimball Junction? Take that, Charles. Yeah, we expect the traffic to grow by 30 to 40 percent by the year 2050. Well, thank you. So currently we are through all of the, the questions um, from the chat and the Q&A. Is there yeah, anybody? Just... Oh, another one. Yeah. And Excellent. By the way, we uh, we appreciate your guys' uh questions and joining us virtually we know this might feel a little bit formal or a little bit stuffy just because not everyone's here but we feel like this helps us get through a lot more questions and be able to answer them 
Um, so hopefully this is a, is a good format and feel free to leave a public comment on just how this virtual meeting has worked out to your expectations or, or ways to improve it. But um, hopefully we're able to meet a lot of your concerns or uh, questions that you have. Uh, but yeah, on option B, will the roads cross SR-224 Lake U Boulevard be one way or remain two way? Uh, Brian, you haven't, I, I don't want to leave you out. So I'm, uh, I'll am i repeat it so I don't catch you off guard. But uh, on option B, will the road, this is really kind of a Charles question, but will the roads across SR-224 like on U Boulevard or Olympic Parkway be one way or remain two way? Thanks for not forgetting about me, Grant. <laughs> and and, and uh, Charles can correct me, but the the crossings that are that go over the top at Uden Olympic will be a two way. Perfect. All right. Well, next question coming in from JT. Would you add a little more color regarding the traffic analysis findings suggesting that the pinch point at the I-80 interchange is not concerning? Anecdotally, as someone who regularly sits in the traffic driving northbound past Ranch Place at 5.45 p.m., the traffic does not appear to lighten for me after I have crossed Olympic Boulevard or after I have crossed Ute Boulevard, which would lead me to believe that the interstate pinch point is problematic. Okay. All right, I'm excited about this. And mm -hmm. apologies in advance for those who don't love talking about traffic, but yeah, I do. So um, the, the interchange design at Kimball Junction is, as we mentioned before, is called a SPUI, which stands for a single point urban intersection. Those particular interchange designs are the king of capacity. They can carry the most traffic out of all interchange designs. So they've got a ton of capacity. However, an interchange is only as good as its closest signal. And that's what we have here where U Boulevard and Olympic Parkway are not very far away. And so people stopping at those signals and the interaction between the two is really what causes the problems that appear to be a pinch point of the interchange. One of the things we did in this study and also in the area plan is we did a theoretical traffic analysis just to test and see is the interchange expected to be problematic if we solve problems at Uton Olympic? So we came up with this fictitious scenario where we, we uh, removed the delay for vehicles going through, through um, Olympic Parkway and U Boulevard so that we could just send the full traffic demand at the interchange. We're gonna throw everything out of it that we can and see how it performs. And the results show that the interchange does have a ton of excess capacity. It performs really well, even with all that extra traffic thrown at it. Um, I will note that um, that's similar to alternative B where we have the tunnel going underneath and just you know, sending all the traffic at the interchange. And even in that alternative, there still uh, is an improvement at the interchange. For example, there's a third left turn lane to go northbound SR-224 to westbound I-80. So, you know, in addition to, to everything else that we're doing there, there's also improvements to the interchange, even in that alternative. Thanks, Charles. We have a question from Galvin Clancy. It appears that options A and C improve through traffic flow by adding an additional travel lane through, but still subjecting all traffic to go through the three intersections that already exist. How are these options able to maintain the same flow as option B, despite option B separating through traffic and avoiding the intersections with Olympic Parkway and Ute Boulevard? It was mentioned previously on this meeting that those intersections are the main impediments to traffic and not the SR-224 I-80 interchange. Yeah, that's a good observation. And uh, one of the primary reasons is an alternative A is with that additional direct access that allows some of the dispersion of the traffic to go away from SR-224 and people that would be coming to SR-224 are able to access directly I-80. Um, additionally, the, um, 
the uh, the widening does provide additional 50% in capacity, um, along with other intersection improvements um, to the dual left turn lane or the left turn lanes on the eastbound and westbound sides. And some of those improvements also provide additional capacity at those um, um, at those intersections. So some of those are the reasons why it's also able to um, look at the flow. Um, one of the measurements that we use is level of service. And that looks at um, all of the vehicles that are going through the um, intersection. So one of the things that we'll have to look at as well is um, as we grade separate the intersection, how do we account for the improvement in the travel time that or that no longer goes through that intersection while comparing it to traffic that goes through an intersection. And, and that'll, uh, just because it won't be quite apples to apples. And so we'll have to figure out ways to make sure that that, that is considered um, in these analysis. Uh, but those are some of the primary ways that it's um, addressing the flow, the increased flow. Thank you, Grant. Uh, the next questioner, I guess uh, maybe more of a comment and we can maybe expound on this a little bit more, uh, comes from Bonnie Park. Um, I'm under the impression that alternative B provides additional active transportation crossings for pedestrians and other non-motorized users. Grant, do you uh, wanna discuss that a little bit more? Yeah. Our, our... I guess um, we have, uh, in each of the alternatives, we have um, different pedestrian improvements. In the a, alternative A and C, there's a new pedestrian underpass at Ute Boulevard um, that is not in alternative B, um, where both alternative A and C have underpasses. Um, those aren't in alternative B, um, but it does have at grade intersection crossings. Um, but it would be a lower levels of volume that it would be crossing. Um, and consequently, um, each of the crossing would have different short um, experiences or shorter experiences crossing those traffic and they'd be one directional on a frontage road system. Um, so it, it's kind of different experiences. We'll have a different performance measures like level of traffic stress and kind of uh, other measures um, looking at the connectivity and accessibility of the pedestrian experience to kind of capture each of those different alternatives um, for a pedestrian and bicyclist. Great, thanks for that, Grant. Our next question comes from Alyssa Schofield. And I apologize if I mispronounce any or all of the words here, um, but has a hydrologist reviewed the depressed road option B to evaluate whether it will intersect the water table, potentiometric surface, and or possible perched water system. Chris, do you wanna? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure if you're referring to, and maybe Jeff can chime in about like the structure itself going underneath uh, the water table, but during the environmental impact statement, um, as we, refine the alternatives and continue to screen them, we will then be looking at uh, impacts to water quality and floodplains. Um, so we will be looking at those types of impacts. And Jeff, if you want to elaborate at all about, you know, potential, I'm not sure if they're referring to maybe like flooding of the trench. Yeah, I mean, that, that those kind of things would be looked at um, a lot deeper during construction. We, we won't get that deep. I mean, whenever they do, if the project does get funded and that was the alternative, they would do a lot of um, borings through the area. And that's where, they're, where they would identify issues like that. Um, like right now, the, the, the elevation at Ute Boulevard is about 15 feet higher than it is down at the interchange. So, and then you have I-80, which is another 20 feet lower than that. So bas basically the elevation of I-80 is lower than the trench, will, the bottom of the trench will be right now. So to give a little bit of 
um, comparison on that. So, you know, in the overall area, I think if there was a, a high water table, it would probably, we would really notice it down on I-80 as well, because that elevation is actually, will, is lower than the bottom of the trench will be. Great, thank you, Jeff. Next question comes from attendee 059233. Have all of you driven the routes in question all the way from the Canyon's base, as well as going into Kimball from eastbound 80 on either a festival event or powder day? That's a yes right here. <laughs> Former Canyon's employee. We, we are fortunate that we have uh, transportation data that allows mm -hmm. us to track the, the travel times all the way um, from I-82 um, different areas. Um, but we know sometimes it gets so bad that the traffic data does, does not accurately represent it. And there's, there's certain things when um, like weather happens like it did today, uh, we saw the traffic going in and um, where other canyons might be closed that off also affects traffic surges. So we're not trying to um, pick the worst of the worst days, but be um, strategic and, and understand what um, the var variety and, and different methods. Um, there's also travel demand strategies that we work with um, Summit County and Park City that they do a great job of implementing to help um, those those special events where there are so many in this area uh, and having plans to be able to accommodate them and those surges. Great, thank you, Grant. But we do uh, we do enjoy uh, coming up to Park City. We we do try to avoid some of those those days, though. <laughs> At least I've been fortunate to. Another question from Ted Palamaki. For the alternatives that add lanes, is there enough space currently to fit them or will some existing commercial buildings need to be raised or relocated? Um, go ahead, Carissa, it looks like you're ready. When we find the alternatives, uh, we'll then be able to have a better idea if any businesses would need to be relocated. You know, in final design, they, we definitely do our best to try to minimize and avoid impacts to uh, residents and businesses. Great, thanks, Carissa. Well, we're getting down to the wire a little bit. But do we have any further questions from anybody that's still online with us or um, just some any clarifications that we can provide to some of the previous questions? Any takers. But we'll hold on online just for a couple more minutes in case you might still be formulating or if anybody is out there considering joining us just a little bit late. But in the meantime, just as we're waiting, if anyone is still developing some questions, uh, just a reminder that we'll be dropping a link in the chat that for those of you that are still on, but if you haven't yet, uh, could you sign our, our meeting sign in? This just helps us kind of keep track of, you know, public meeting participation throughout the study. And this, pro this video will be posted on our project website, and it will also be on the Summit County Facebook page of uh, just the recording of this live. And many of the links that you saw on the chat today are also going to be directly on that live post on the Summit County website for existing resources. And finally, we just wanna make sure you still have our, our website information. I know that was a while ago. 
in the chat. Um, and just another general reminder that these were really great questions and comments this evening, and it's been really helpful for us throughout this process, but we'd love for, for you all to capture these in formal comments. And those can be made on our email, on, by emailing us through our project website, voicemail, text, or, or even a written letter written to the, sent to the project team, which we need postmarked by the final day of the comment period, which is January 27th. And there should be some links in the chat as well, just for you guys to, to grab before you head out. With that, it is 7.30. So Grant, Carissa, Jeff, Brian, Charles, Heidi are our fearless leaders. Any additional comments, thoughts from the team here before we sign off for the evening? Uh, thank you for all those that joined and um, we hope that you'll provide public comment on the, the website. And, uh, and additionally, tell your, your friends and neighbors um, and coworkers about this. Um, and, uh, and feel free to reach out to us and, and uh, email. Um, if you have additional questions as you're going through the project website, and we appreciate your time here today. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and we hope you have a great evening. And this was helpful to you all. Take care and have a great evening. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.